Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Don't be afraid of trouble. Say right away, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And believe it. Don't just quote it, believe it. Don't just clap about it in church. Say it to yourself when you're home alone in your midnight hour. Greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. I want the people of God in this last hour to be bold and courageous, not obnoxious, but bold and courageous. And don't you get into the fear that the Bible talks about. The Bible says in the last days, men's hearts will fail them for fear. Well, it's not going to be us. You know why? We don't have to fear for one reason, the God factor. I know what's going on in the world, but we've got God. I know what the economy's doing, but we've got God. I know what the humanists say, but we've got God. We've got the God factor in our life, and that makes everything different for us. The whole dynamic has changed for the child of God because if God be for me, who can be against me? If God is on my side, whom shall I fear? If we're going to be believers, I think we need to act like it. Don't be running around with some bumper sticker on your car if you're going to back off from everything. Amen? Amen. I go to these foreign countries, and when I came out of Rwanda, where the genocide was several years ago, we had such, such a great opportunity to minister to those beautiful people. And I got on the plane, and I had such a horrible sore throat, and my mouth was burning like fire. Didn't know what was wrong with me. Woke up the next morning, my eye was swelled shut. A mosquito had bit me on the eye, and my eye was swelled shut. I was going into Europe to minister. I got to the hotel and had to have an IV to get the swelling out of my eye. And that don't stop you. You just keep doing what you're doing. I just came out of Papua New Guinea. Felt fine, preached to all these people, ran around, did all these outreaches, got on the plane one hour after I was on the plane, got sick, started throwing up. I said, well, I guess that's the devil's kiss goodbye. <laughs> But you know what? I didn't say, well, I'm not coming back. I just can't take this kind of demonic attack. I said, I'll be back. <laughs> I'll be back. Come on. I said, I'm coming back. Amen? When we opened our church in the inner city in St. Louis, we picked one of the worst neighborhoods where people desperately needed help. And the first Sunday, I stood in the pulpit, and I turned to the north, south, east, and west, and I said, I'm here to stay. I'm here to stay. I'm here to stay. I'm here to stay. And we're still there. Amen? And the neighborhood's getting cleaned up. The crime is being reduced. People are being saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. Have we been attacked? Oh, you better believe it. Even some of the churches down there said, we don't need some big ministry coming in here taking our people. I'm like, give me a break. I didn't come down here to take your people. I came to feed people and put clothes on them and try to be a blessing in the kingdom of God. It's pretty good when you can't even help people without another church getting mad at you. Shows you where religion's at, don't it? I think there's enough sinners to go around. I don't think we've got to fight about them. <laughs> Amen? If I did get a couple of years, there's plenty more, so don't worry about it. I want to put a little fire in you tonight. I'm here to fan your flame. You need to know who you are. You need to know who you belong to. We don't have to act like the rest of the world in these last days. Don't be excessive about watching the news. Yeah, I know you want to know what's going on. Well, you, even after you watch it, you still don't know what's going on. <laughs> I'm here to bring you the good news. 
Jesus said, I come to bring you good news that will bring you great joy. Every place on which the sole of your foot shall tread, that have I given unto you. You take a step forward, the enemy's going to bring opposition. Don't you let it drive you backward. You just keep going forward. Keep going forward. Keep going forward. And keep going forward. And we need to have the attitude that Paul did. I'm determined to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus died to take hold of me. Jesus didn't die for us so we could have some dead religion and sit around and be miserable, depressed, bored and do nothing with our lives. He died for us so we could have a relationship with God through Him and so we could do great things in Jesus' name and for His glory. I'm sure that in the natural, Joshua thought, well, I can't take Moses' place. I don't have that kind of skill. I don't even know if the people will like me. But one of the first things that God said to him in verse 5, Joshua 1, 5, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you nor forsake you. He never told him to go be like Moses. He said, Moses was what he was because I was with him, and I will be with you the same way I was with Moses. He said, you don't have to worry because the God factor is on your side. Amen? Amen? You can do a job that you're not qualified for if God opens the door for you. He can give you understanding, supernatural understanding that will go beyond somebody else's education. Come on. I'm preaching in two-thirds of the world and almost failed English. I think it's funny. It is funny, ha-ha, funny. God uses the weak and the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. You don't necessarily need skill to serve God. You just need a good heart. You don't need ability. You need availability. Here am I, God. Send me. Amen. He said, be strong, confident of a good courage, and you will lead this people in the land which I promised to give them. If you're bold and courageous, you can bring a lot of other people out of bondage. Verse 9, have not I commanded you, be strong, vigorous, and very courageous. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. You go to work, He's with you. You drive in traffic, He's with you. You go to the store, He's with you. Everywhere you go, He's with you. You have a problem, He's with you. You have a joy, He's with you. Isaiah 43, verses 2 and 5. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the river, they'll not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned or scorched, nor will the flame kindle upon you. Verse 5, fear not, for I am with you. When Daniel was in the lion's den, God was with him in there and shut the lion's mouth. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was in the fiery furnace, and the king turned the furnace up seven times hotter than usual, they took a stand for God, and what was their blessing? The fire got turned up hotter than ever. Have you ever felt in your life like you made a right choice, you did the right thing, but the fire got turned up even hotter? Well, I felt like that a lot of times. Like, when is doing the right thing going to pay off? <laughs> but when the king looked into that fiery furnace, he put three men in there bound. He looked in and saw four men loose. Man, 
You go into the fire all bound up with your bondages and your problems, and you come out on the other side with a guest that you didn't go in with, loose from all those bondages and problems. We don't have to be afraid of trouble. Don't be afraid of trouble. Say right away, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And believe it. Don't just quote it. Believe it. Don't just clap about it in church. Say it to yourself when you're home alone in your midnight hour. Greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. Isaiah 41, 10. Fear not. There is nothing to fear, for I am with you. <laughs> Do not look around you in terror and be dismayed, for I am your God. Once again, if you're secure, if you know who you are in Christ, you will have no problem trying things because you know that you're a lot more than what you do or don't do. What you do doesn't define who you are. That's the way it is in the world, but it's not that way in the kingdom of God. The fear of man, that really tears a lot of us up, doesn't it? What are they going to do? What are they going to think? If I do this, will they reject me? In Galatians 1.10, the apostle Paul said, if I would have been trying to be popular with people, I would not now be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wonder how many people lose their destiny because they find out they can't do what God wants them to do and have everybody like them. How many people you, get, you radically fall in love with Jesus, and then your own family members reject you. It's always somebody that's going to mean something to you. It's close friends or family members. It's somebody you care about. It's somebody you want relationship with. You think that's not the devil? We've got to open our eyes and wake up and realize that Satan is using the fear of man to keep us from having any depth in our relationship with God. We know all about that. When I felt like God was calling me into ministry and Dave agreed and we took these steps, man, we got thrown out of our church, we lost our friends, we had family members that came against us and judged us and didn't understand what we were doing. I had all these people that didn't think a woman should be doing what I was doing. God, I don't know how I'm still here. When I look back and I think about the things that God led me through, if, if God wouldn't have been with me, I couldn't have stood it. But it's true that He's with us, and He gives us a protection and a grace that enables us to keep on keeping on. All you got to do is say, I will not quit, and I will not let what people think of me control me. Let's look at Isaiah 8, 13. This is a wonderful scripture about the fear of man. When we fear man and bow down to man, it actually offends God. The Lord of hosts regard him as holy and honor his holy name. By regarding him as your only hope of safety and let him be your fear and let him be your dread lest you offend him by your fear of man and your distrust of him. Is that not good? I don't want to offend God because I'm letting what people think of me control my actions. I believe when people come against us, we need to learn how to shake it off. That's what Jesus told the disciples to do. In Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through 5, it says, He sent the disciples out two by two to preach the gospel in all the towns and heal the sick. And He said, when you go into a town and they reject you, they criticize you, and they come against you, Shake the dust of that place off your feet and go on to the next place because you will not run out of towns until I return. I believe what happens is we're going along and we're making good progress in our walk with God and in whatever God has called us to do, and then all of a sudden we get some attack of rejection. I don't think there's anything more painful to the human soul than to be rejected by people that you want acceptance from. And we spend an awful lot of time trying not to get rejected. 
But you just have to face it. If you're going to do anything for God, if you're going to do great things for God, if you're going to take the land that Jesus died for you to have, you will have to deal with rejection. But the good news is you've got the God factor because he has already said, I will never reject you. And when they reject you, in reality, they are rejecting me. Because if God sends you and people reject you, then they're really not rejecting you. They're rejecting God's decision and what he has decided to do. Amen. In Acts chapter 28, Paul went to the island of Malta. He built a little fire there and he was sitting around ministering to the people. And a serpent, a snake crawled out of the fire and attached itself to his hand. It was a very poisonous snake. And the people said, oh, this man must be a murderer or some really bad man because now he's going to die. And Paul didn't go, ah, ah. The Bible says, Paul simply shook it off and went off with his sermon. You know what? I'm learning more and more how to just shake it off when people come against me. How many of you got a few things you need to just shake off? You did the best you could, and everybody turned against you. Shake it off. You felt like you were following God. You got judged and criticized. Shake it off. You did your very best. You thought you should have gotten a promotion at work, and some ungodly person that you know really shouldn't have had it that even told lies about you to get it got the promotion. Now you're like, wow. You keep a good attitude and watch what God does for you. Come on, I said, you keep a good attitude and watch what God does for you. If I were you and that person needs a ride to work next week, I'd go get them and bring them to work. You say, well, that's not normal. That's right. We don't have to be normal. We've got a new normal. Amen. Y'all getting anything out of this tonight? The God factor. Acts chapter 7, 9 through 10, Joseph, I love to look at this. And the patriarchs, Jacob's sons, boiling with envy and hatred and anger, sold Joseph into slavery in Egypt, but God, uh-oh, we don't need to go any further. They hated him because he had a dream. They hated him because he was daddy's favorite. They hated him because he was the baby of the family. But God saw Joseph's heart. And everywhere he went, God put him in charge of something. Even in the jail, he got put in charge of the jail. He became a ruler in Egypt and was there to help his family when they were in need. Amen? Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. And as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it for good. <laughs> I was abused by my father sexually for many years of my life on a regular basis. It wasn't something that happened once or twice. I'm sure there were hundreds of times. It was a nightmare. It left me broken. He stole my innocence. He stole my childhood. I lived in fear. I watched him come home drunk every weekend and hit my mother and rant and rave and scream and yell and be manipulative and controlling. I was not allowed to have any friends. I was never allowed to go to a sporting event. But God. Amen. But God, God got in the way. And God says, I will even take your mess and I'll make it your message if you'll give it to me. I'll take your mess and I'll turn it into a miracle in your life. I'll use that manure to mature you and grow you up and get you into a place where you can do great things for God and still keep your head on right. People that have been through things grow up. Because let me tell you something, when all you've got is God, you get to know God really well. Amen. 
but God. I love that. But God. The Bible says in Acts 10 that Jesus went about doing good, and yet they hated him, and they crucified him, and he died a horrible death on a cross. But had Satan known what he was doing, he would not have crucified the Lord of glory because he was opening up the way for every person that would ever live to have an intimate relationship with God. He was crucified on that cross. But the Bible says, but God raised him from the dead on the third day. But God, but God. And then finally in Ephesians, Matter of fact, I think we're going to go there and read it. Everybody say, but God. but God. You see, it doesn't matter what kind of start you got in life. It's how you finish. And now that God's involved, I say you're going to have a great finish. You've got the God factor. Amen. Now, you need to pay a little bit of attention to this, but these are just beautiful beyond anything we can imagine. Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 1. And you he made alive when you were dead, slain by your trespasses and sins, in which at one time you walked habitually. You were following the course and the fashion of this world. You were under the sway of the tendency of this present age. You were following the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan. You were obedient to and under the control of demon spirits that still constantly work in the sons of disobedience, the careless, the rebellious, the unbelieving, who go against the purposes of God. How many of you can remember for a minute that terrible life you used to have when you were in such bondage? Among these, we as well as you once lived and conducted ourselves in the passions of our flesh, our behavior governed by a corrupt and sensual nature, obeying the impulses of the flesh and the thoughts of the mind. Dear God, I remember when I would wake up in the morning and my mind would say, you're depressed today, and I'd be depressed all day. Whatever my carnal mind said, that's what I did. Whatever I felt like, that was what I did. I didn't know the Word of God. I didn't know what was available to me. I lived in darkness. I lived in bondage because nobody had ever taught me anything. We were then by nature children of God's wrath and heirs of His indignation like the rest of mankind. What a mess we were in. Let's stop and think for just a minute. What a mess we were in. Dead in our sin. Being controlled by demon spirits. Living in darkness. Deceived. Not knowing the truth. Verse 4. But God. But God, so rich is He in mercy because of and in order to satisfy the great and wonderful and intense love with which He loved us. Even when we were dead, slain by our own shortcomings and trespasses, He made us alive together in fellowship and in union with Christ. He gave us the very life of Christ, the same new life with which He raised Him from the dead. While I was dead in my sin, being controlled by demon spirits, I had the God factor come into my life, and He raised me from that state of sinfulness and deadness and gave me as a gift the life of God to dwell on the inside of me. But God! Well, I would like to re-emphasize a point from today's teaching. No matter what is happening in the world, or no matter what kind of trouble you're experiencing in your life right now, you have what I call the God factor on your side. Because the Bible says, if God be for us, who can be against us? If God is on our side, whom shall we fear? Having the God factor means that with God, you have the advantage over any circumstance, over anybody coming against you, and over all fear. Well, when you are having problems in your life, what is the best thing for you to do? I believe it's to continue walking in love. So often when we have personal problems, we kind of turn in and can even actually begin to be grouchy or cranky or even mistreat other people because we have our own problems. But I really don't think we ever saw Jesus do that. He always walked in love. 
And I know that many of you are going through difficult things right now, and maybe one of the things that you're saying to God over and over is, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Well, maybe you could just take this today like God is actually speaking to you through this teaching, and I believe he would say to you, walk in love. Just make sure that you keep walking in love because love is very, very, very powerful.